Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning service for Woodburn United Methodist Church here in Oregon. I hope you all had a great week, and those of you who are local, I hope you enjoyed the 20 minutes of sunlight that we had the other day without having to have a coffee, but it was marvelous, and for myself, I know that the sun just looking in the sky hurt my eyes. It's been overcast and cloudy and smoky for so long. I'm glad that you're here today, and let's join together now in the call to worship. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all in the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? God praises the poor. God, sorry, God raises the poor from the dust and lifts up the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes with the princes of their people. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to live so God can use me. If you can pray with me the prayer of invocation. Gracious God, who is life, joy, and peace, grant us grace upon grace that we might find our way in these dark days. Make us people of the day who walk by the light of your love. May our entitlement give way to towel and basin service. May our rights never be disconnected from our responsibilities to serve the least of these, as we serve Jesus in them. Help our anger to become Christ-like action. Help our frustration to become prayerful ministry. In the name of our Lord Jesus, who emptied himself. Amen.
Today's scripture is from the book of Esther, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha the Ag Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and did obeisance to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance. When the king's servant, then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? When they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would avail, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated. But he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone, so, having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Azaharis. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Azaharis, they cast pure, which means the lot, before Haman on the day and for the month, and the lot fell on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Azaharis, There is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws. So it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, so that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people as well to do with them as it seems good to you. Now, this is a time in the service where we normally would have offering. And it seems really weird to be asking for money over, well, a camera and over the internet. You all have been very faithful in your giving. We are not hurting desperately like many churches are. We have lost several revenue sources because we haven't been able to rent out the building. And that has hurt, but we are, we are making it. And we are making it because you have continued to be faithful in your giving and in your pledges. And we deeply appreciate that, but periodically a reminder is also helpful. I know it is for me. So I just want to remind you to continue uh, to send in your, your pledges and your tithes and to the church every week. And thank you so much for doing so. It has enabled us to open up our doors to those in need. It has enabled us to provide technology where necessary. It's enabled us to talk to the school districts and see how we can help and how we can use the gifts that you continue to provide in ways that further God's kingdom. So thank you. As we move toward prayer, I want to once again take time to have a, a call and response. So as I say a, a prayer request or a thanks, uh, just repeat the, the words with me 
that are on the screen at the end of each request so that we can pray together and give thanks together. We have good news this week that two of our own went through surgery and both Tom and Diane are doing well. For their successful surgery, we say thank you, God. But for their continued healing, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. For the rains that have soaked this land that have so badly needed it, we say thank you, God. God, thank you, God, for the firefighters that are on the front lines, for those who, how, whose houses are still in danger. Say, Lord, hear our prayers. For those who are struggling to find new work or new housing, say, Lord, Hear our prayers. For those who have lost loved ones and need your comfort and need your support, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. We raise all of our prayers up to you, God. Every last one of them. The little and the big, the ones that weigh on our hearts and the ones that we can barely even stand to mention they just hurt so bad. And Lord, for the teachers who are returning to a school that they were never trained for, for the students who are having to stay home in an environment that they've never had to learn in, for technology that is new to everyone and strange and awkward at best, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. I want to take a moment and also remember uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who we lost this week just before taping, for a life well lived in service to a country that she loved, for continually standing up for justice and for the least of these, for a race well run. We say thank you, God. And as the fighting is going to be contentious over who is going to replace her and when, for that whole situation, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. And now we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I try and preach to anyone else, I always try and make sure that I'm preaching to myself first. Some weeks, however, that is more evident than others. And this week is basically a reminder for me. And if you get something out of it, great, but that's kind of secondary. Before I became a Methodist, I grew up and I served in a Wesleyan church that was founded with a strong focus on social justice, but over the years has slowly become more and more fundamentalist, especially lately. It's filled with so many wonderful godly people, but because on a denominational level, it was so much Jesus and me and nothing else matters except just that. <sighs> It created a firm dividing line between what was sacred and what was seen as secular. And only the sacred was appropriate to be preached upon or should matter to the church. So loving your neighbor was fine, but signing a petition to allow more income, low income housing in the neighborhood was not. That sort of thing. I could say that God loves and values each person, but not speak on waves as a society or even as a church that we might fail to show that value in how black or Latino, Native American, or LGBTQ people are treated. When I came to the UMC, I had this wonderful sense of freedom. I could speak my mind. I could preach on how we are all connected on the ways that faith has to be put into action, not just as individuals, but as institutions to bring justice to all of God's people. My first Sunday, I was so excited. I wrote my unleashed sermon, but when I reread it, it was pathetic. It was bland. It was beating around the bush. It barely said anything. So I rewrote it and went further. Blech. I did it again. Meh. Eventually I had to give up. It was such a struggle to unleash, to go, to push anywhere. At least as far as I thought I should. Because looking around, I mean, other pastors were preaching entire series on Black Lives Matter. They were painting the names of people lost to police violence on the side of the building. They were talking about how anyone who doesn't preach on racial justice every week shouldn't even be in the pulpit. And while I support Black Lives Matter and almost anything which has the possibility of narrowing the deadly racial disparities in this nation on any level, I spent the time preaching on God being found in chaos because it was also in the midst of this pandemic. It felt like I was beating around the bush, that I wasn't pushing far enough. I wasn't speaking directly enough. That's still a constant concern every week, to be honest. Am I really speaking to those issues which are most important, most need a voice to be put on them? Or am I speaking to what is safe, what will get nods and applause? Am I seeking to please God or people? Is it possible to please both of them at once, even in a church? Am I a coward if I'm not as assertive, even aggressive, in what I say from the pulpit? <laughs> And there is still something in my head, perhaps in all of our heads, that looks at the big issues, the international news, the news of injustice and political action, poverty, endemic problems, and thinks, yeah, this is going to have to wait for somebody bigger than me. Because it seems so out of reach to do anything about some issues, other than throw some money at it to ease my conscience, to be honest. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Lincoln, Joan of Arc, RBG, the big people, right? In the shadow of people like that, stepping up can almost seem prideful. I mean, who am I to put myself next to men and women like that? I and mean, there's always someone smarter, more creative, more holy, a better leader, better communicator. Always. It can be hard to step up for these massive issues, when there are so many more qualified people able to speak, more positioned to act, 
Especially in the church, we so often accidentally teach people that they aren't needed except for their money. Leave the real work, the big work, to those special people, the called people, the big ones who God speaks to, the ones who have miracles happen when they pray, the ones with visions and dreams and everything we don't have, right? Today I want to look at Esther which is one of the stranger books of the Bible, which is saying something because we've dealt with some strange ones. But before we do, let's back up a bit. In biblical history, there are three Middle Eastern empires that matter tremendously. First came the Assyrians. They conquered and deported the northern kingdom of Israel. They were then taken over by the Babylonians, who in turn conquered and deported the southern kingdom of Judah when they rebelled against their rule. There the people stayed for 60 years while the Babylonian Empire was conquered by the Persians. Once in power, the Persian king Cyrus allowed the people of Judah to return home. That was what the devout Jews had been waiting for for the last 60 years, a return to the covenant with God, a return to the promised land. But after 60 years, you can imagine that many Jews didn't really care to return to the boonies and risk their lives scraping away at a ruined city, when many of them happily were situated in the capital of the most powerful empire in the world. Many had acquired wealth, power, comfort. Why would they want to give that up? Over time, more people filtered back in several additional ways. The temple was built, until finally 60 years more had passed since the Jewish people had first returned to Israel. 120 since they'd been exiled. Then a king named Xerxes came to power. You might know Xerxes as the king who invaded Greece and led the Persian forces at the Battle of Thermopylae, better known as the Battle of the 300. Spartan warriors, narrow pass, a bunch of movies made after it, that sort of thing. Well, after a disastrous sea battle, battle at Salamis, uh, Xerxes returned to his capital to lick his wounds and, frankly, salve his ego, mostly through building a massive palace and a massive harem. And so, enter Esther, who, along with her uncle Mordecai, had remained in the Persian capital of Susa, a young Jewish woman. So right away, we know that she and her uncle are not some of the truly faithful, because all of those had returned. Then the semi-faithful had returned. Then the vaguely faithful, the ones left, are secular Jews. Then King Xerxes' queen embarrassed him, and he put her aside and went looking for someone new. The Bible paints it in the best light possible, that the king was looking for a new queen and uses some of that language, or at least what we translate into that language, but uh, the real situation was a lot more complicated because the historical record clearly shows that Xerxes never officially got rid of his original queen. He was looking for someone to take his mind off the queen, to be his main concubine, which still had tremendous prestige and power in that time, but Xerxes was also known to go through women rather quickly, shall we say? So any position was ephemeral at best. But anyway, in an effort to achieve this, Xerxes' people scoured the empire for the most beautiful women they could find, and they stumbled across Esther. And after a truly disturbing trial run, she became King Xerxes' favorite. In America, that makes her success. She was young, beautiful, wealthy. What more could anyone ask for? But look at it from a Jewish perspective back then. She was a faithless Jew, staying when she should have returned. Not only that, but she hid her ancestry from fear or shame, we don't know, but she hid it. And she got where she got by sleeping with their conqueror, their ruler, as part of a pagan king's harem. Esther was far from a good Jew or even a godly woman, as you could possibly get at the time. Now, whether she had a choice or not, and she almost certainly did not have one in any of this, in the eyes of her people, she had sold out her heritage and her God. Time went on, and Esther barely saw the king anymore because 
he was the king. But her uncle got in trouble with one of the king's most powerful servants. And instead of just offing her uncle and moving on, this servant, Haman, got the king to order the genocide of every Jew in the Persian Empire, which at the time was pretty much all of them. And suddenly, Esther's the person best positioned to save her people. Simply by telling the king who she is, that she is a Jew. And she chokes. She's just one woman among a vast harem, and she hasn't seen the king in ages. She would risk her life to try and see him without being summoned. It takes her ages, but she finally meets the king, and she chokes again, asking the king and Haman to come to a dinner party she is having just for them. There, she chokes yet again, chickening out from saying, I am a Jew, and instead she invites them for yet another banquet. And there she finally musters the courage and confesses that she is a Jew too. And if the law goes through, she will be murdered along with everyone else. King Xerxes goes nuts. Haman gets executed. Executed. The Jewish people get the right to fight back and protect themselves. And Esther's uncle Mordecai gets a promotion. It's almost a perfect ending. There's only one thing missing from this story. Really. God. Esther is the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention God. Not once. No miracles, no angels, no callings, no voices, nothing. Not even prayer is mentioned. It is purposefully and blatantly secular, just like Esther herself. Now think about how weird it is that a book which refuses to talk about God should be in the Bible. The book about God. But Esther is there precisely because despite resolutely refusing to talk about God, you can see God on every single page, guiding and inspiring and silently leading. I mean, of course God was there. Of course Mordecai and Esther were being led and inspired and positioned. I mean, it's clear as day without a word being said. Esther is in the Bible because it acts as evidence against the idea that anything can truly be termed secular, because God is in all of it. It rejects the idea that only the most qualified, the godliest, can be used. Esther didn't wait for a miracle, hear an audible voice, or even seek God's direction. She wasn't particularly brave, and she certainly wasn't particularly devout. She was pretty, and she was scared. Esther reminds me that God cares about everything. Nothing is truly secular, truly apart from God. There is no person God is not wooing, no situation God is not interested in, and me not hearing a voice, not being the most spiritual, most powerful, is no excuse. In fact, no religious qualification at all is required for God to use you. I, we don't even need to acknowledge that God is at work, though that certainly helps. And Esther reminds me that big things are made up of small things. All she said was, I'm a Jew too. And her people got a chance at survival. They weren't instantly saved. It isn't that they have never faced threats before. We all know that they certainly have. But it gave them a chance. Just a few words in the right place. She didn't tackle everything. She tackled what she could. The late Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said, real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. Little actions in the right place make a difference. For years, this church has made a difference for decades through the Woodburn Family Learning Center, through donations of diapers year after year, through all that the UMW does, through events and compassion and support. But let me tell you, just about what I've seen in the last few weeks. When the fires began to spread, many of you personally took in family and friends as they fled. Many of you were worried about your homes themselves being under threat, and yet still, when this church had the opportunity, we opened our doors and took in strangers who needed a safe place to land as well. People rally, providing sleeping bags, air mats, cots, food on a moment's notice. 
And as fire slowed down, I saw people rally again to help a family who had lost everything. First with a place to live, then with mattresses, pots, pans, towels, toys, dressers, more, everything that they need. And in all of that, I don't think I heard God mentioned very much. I certainly don't remember seeing a big obvious miracle or anyone talking about hearing God speak to them directly. But I saw God these last few weeks through all of you. Of course, more needs still exist, but those needs don't. Those needs were met by people being God's hands and feet. Not the holiest people, not the big people, not the famous people, but God's people. Taking the secular and filling it with a love that can only be God's, a presence that is from above. I am so glad you have not tired of doing good. That loving your neighbor is not just a mumbled phrase, but a way of life. Thank you for pulling me along sometimes, too. So far, at least, this seems like it might end up being a normal week. So we, we might, I mean, it's 2020, so who knows, right? I mean, the meteorites might hit by Thursday, but right now it looks like a very normal week. And for us right now, that means our three 9 a.m. Uh, get-togethers, uh, study with pastor on Tuesday at 9 a.m., uh, Sunday forum at 9 a.m. on Sunday, and a book study group on Thursdays at 9 a.m. And each one of them, with the possible exception of study with pastor, because it's with me, is something that is highly worth taking part of. If you are looking for community, if you are looking for time together, if you are looking for ways to grow in your faith while you are unable to be out and about as much as you would like. These are fantastic opportunities. 
and I hope you take advantage of them. Now, there is one thing, however, that is unique about today. If you are watching this on Sunday, the 20th of September, 20th of September, Anyway, if you are watching today at three o'clock, our annual conference is actually putting on a online service called Breathing Smoke, Seeking Hope. And it's a time of prayer and renewal and worship. And there will be a link in the description of this video, just, just down below the video, if you want to uh, participate in that. And I hope I'll see you there. It should be a good time and a refreshing time and a time to mourn. And I think that's all the announcements that I have for you this week, other than to tell you uh, once again, thank you so much for everyone who stepped up throughout these fires and with relocating this family that we've been working on. They are fully situated in their new place and they have pretty much everything that they need. And the generosity of this church and the way that they have stepped up and provided repeatedly and at a moment's notice and sacrificially in many cases is just phenomenal and I'm so proud of you and I'm so happy to be to be part of this so take this uh, blessing as you go this week may you not grow tired of doing good may you run your race in full the race that Christ our Lord has called you to run May God grant you endurance, stamina, and wisdom in choosing your course and in staying on it. May you be fruitful. May you see the finish line. May you know a life well lived and a race well run at the end. Go in peace. Have a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday. Thank <laughs> you.